Hello everybody and greetings from MedTube channel for medical education and today's topic is the last of cardiac abnormal rhythms the tachycardias which are defined as any cardiac rhythm with a heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute now to start there are many classifications used to classify the tachycardias as the site of the firing focus or the QRS width but in here we are using the regularity of an easy ECG strap because it's pretty simple to pick up on an ECG. So tachycardias are classified as regular and irregular. Regular means that the RR interval is constant and not changeable. Irregular means that the RR interval is changeable. Now the regular tachycardias, which will be discussed in this video, are further classified based on the site of the firing focus into the following. An SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia from the name supraventricular tachycardia means the site of the firing focus is above the ventricles now SVTs are again classified based on the site of the firing focus into the following the first is called sinus tachycardia which is originating from the SA node the second is called atrial tachycardia which is originating from the atrial muscle and then we have atrial flutter we have junctional tachycardia which is also known as nodal tachycardia which is originating from the AV node due to increased automaticity of the AV node and then we have AV NRT which is known as atrioventricular nodal re-entry tachycardia which is due to a functional re-entry within the AV node not due to increased automaticity of the AV node as in junctional tachycardia and the last is known as AVRT, atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia, which is due to an anatomical re-entry circuit involving the accessory pathway and therefore bypassing the AV node. And usually it occurs in the setting of a Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Now in this video, we're going to discuss all of these SVTs along with ventricular tachycardia and how we identify them on an ECG excluding sinus tachycardia because it is simply a normal sinus rhythm with a heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute. That means that you're going to see a normal P wave preceding each QRS complex. And it could be physiological as in stress or exercise, or it could be pathological as in hyperthyroidism or hypovolemia as in dehydration, or it could be due to drug side effects as in beta agonists. Now, if you have a persistent sinus tachycardia without an obvious cause, or let's say idiopathic, then we would call it as inappropriate sinus tachycardia, which is typically seen in young, healthy female adults. But it's actually a rare condition. Now, irregular tachycardias are also further classified based on the site of the firing focus into SVTs and ventricular fibrillation. And SVTs are also further classified based on the site of the firing focus into atrial fibrillation, multifocal atrial tachycardia, and atrial flutter with variable block. Now please note that these are not all the conditions that comprise tachycardia, but these are the commonly encountered ones. And any of these tachycardias could be either sustained tachycardia or a paroxysmal tachycardia which means it comes and goes now regular tachycardias again we have the SVTs and the ventricular tachycardia and now starting with the first SVT atrial tachycardia and it's characterized by the following on an ECG we have an atrial rate of less than 200 beats per minute we have an abnormal P wave morphology because it's originating from the atria muscle we have an abnormal P wave axis also because the depolarization waves are arising from the atrial muscles we have normal QRS complexes because the ventricles are normal and we have an isoelectric baseline unlike the atrial flutter now in this ECG here we have a typical atrial tachycardia first you can see that there is a regular rhythm you have a heart rate of about 120 beats per minute and you have narrow QRS complexes and if you look at the P waves First, you could look at the P waves for only two. You'll see that they are inverted here and here and here. Inverted P waves. Also, on leads two, three, and AVF are inverted, which is abnormal. And you have upright P waves in V1, 
which is also abnormal. And the second thing, if you look at the morphology, the P waves look peaked, as in here, and here, and here, and all over. And this is also abnormal. This is atrial tachycardia. And with the second tachycardia, which is known as atrial flutter. However, atrial flutter is usually due to a re-entry circuit within the right atrium. Unlike the atrial tachycardia, which could be due to increased automaticity, or due to a re-entry circuit within the right atrium. Now, the atrial flutter, the other two differences are the following. The first is that we have a heart rate of 200 to 400 beats per minute, giving AV blocks, which is because the AV node cannot conduct atrial rates of discharge of greater than 200 beats per minute. The other difference is that you have a loss of the isoelectric baseline in atrial flutter, which is because the too many P waves, also known as the flutter waves, are so close together that you cannot see the isoelectric baseline in between. Here we have a really good example on atrial flutter with 2 to 1 block, which means for every 2 P waves, we have 1 QRS complex. So first you can see that the rhythm is regular, and there is a tachycardia with a rate of 150 beats per minute because um, on if you take one thick line and the, ne the second QRS is on the second thick line, which means the ventricular rate is of 150 beats per minute. However, the P wave rate, the atrial rate here is about 300 per minute. And that's because for every two P waves, you have one QRS complex. So if you look here at lead 2, we look at the P waves, but we actually call them in atrial flutter as flutter waves. So if you look at the first flutter wave, and the second, and then a QRS complex. One flutter wave, a second flutter wave, and then a QRS. So every two flutter waves, one QRS complex. Here we have atrial flutter with variable block, which is actually alternating between 2 to 1 block and 4 to 1 block. So here you have two flutter waves, and then four flutter waves, and then two flutter waves, and then four flutter waves. So this is variable block. And this is actually an irregular rhythm. So this one is actually part of, SV, of an irregular SVT. And also we can see here the characteristic so tooth appearance of atrial flutter. Um, and also atrial flutter actually has some other subtypes, but I'm not discussing the subtypes, it's just the general characteristics of atrial flutter on an ECG. And now coming to the third type of SVTs, which is junctional tachycardia, and it's characterized by the following. Absent P wave, or the P wave could be immediately before or immediately after the QRS complex, and we have normal QRS complexes. And remember that junctional tachycardia is due to increased automaticity of the AV node. Here we have a good example, and you can see first the regular rhythm and the tachycardia of about 150 beats per minute. And you, can s you cannot see P waves anywhere. Um, actually, this ECG is not very clear, but you don't really have P waves before the each QRS complex. You simply have a narrow complex tachycardia. And now coming to the fourth type of SVTs, which is AVNRT, atrioventricular nodal re-entry tachycardia, which is due to a functional re-entry circuit within the AV node. Now, it looks pretty much similar to junctional tachycardia, with a little bit of small differences as QRS alternance and widespread ST segment depression, but it's not really that significant to tell it apart from junctional tachycardia on an ACG, because the management is more or less the same for most of the regular SVTs, with the first line being vagal maneuvers, the second line being adenosine, and the third line being AV blocking agents, as in calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Here we have an example on AVNRT. First, you can see it's a regular rhythm with a rapid, narrow complex tachycardia, a heart rate of about 220 beats per minute. You, can s you cannot see P waves anywhere on the ECG, and you have widespread ST segment depression. This is AVNRT. Here we have another example of AVNRT. Pretty much the same findings. And you have here QRS alternates. You can see some QR, the QRS complexes vary in their amplitude.
And again, there are actually multiple subtypes of AVNRT, but we're just discussing here the major characteristics of AVNRT on an ECG. And now coming to our last type of regular SVTs, which is AVRT. And again, AVRT is due to an anatomical re-entry circuit via the accessory pathway, usually in, in the setting of wolf parkinson white syndrome, with, and, and in that case, the accessory pathway is called as the bundle of Kent. And AVRT is characterized by the following on an ECG. We have an absent P wave, usually. We have a T wave inversion, ST segment depression, QRS alt alternance. And we can classify AVRT based on the direction of the re entry circuit. And orthodromic means that the anti grid conduction is through the AV node, and the retrograde conduction is through the accessory pathway, which is kind of a clockwise direction. Whereas antidromic direction means that the retrograde direction is through the AV node and the anti-grade direction or conduction is through the accessory pathway. And since the anti-grade conduction is through the accessory pathway, this gives us the abnormal ventricular depolarization and therefore the white QRS complex. And this is the main difference between antidromic and orthodromic, which is the white QRS in antidromic conduction. <coughs> This ECG shows us a typical wolf parkinson white syndrome in sinus rhythm. And uh, you can see the uh, classical triad of shortened PR interval, a white QRS complex, and a delta wave, a slurring of the, init of the beginning of the QRS complex due to an early depolarization of the ventricle. Now, normally in wolf parkinson white syndrome, patients have a sinus rhythm as in this ACG, and the conduction is simply spread <clears throat> through the accessory pathway to the ventricles. But if we have a re-entry circuit, either antidromic or orthodromic, as seen in the previous slide, then we would have a tachycardia, as in this slide, which is called as AVRT. And when, whenever you have an AVRT, the signs on the ECG for a wolf parkinson white syndrome will be lost. And you cannot really tell anymore, was this a wolf parkinson white syndrome or not? And if you want to describe this ECG, then it's actually a regular ECG with a narrow complex tachycardia and absent P waves. You have no P waves whatsoever in all of this ECG. So, if you're thinking of what I'm thinking, this looks exactly like AVNRT that we've seen previously. And you cannot really tell this apart from AVNRT. And it doesn't really matter because the first line of management is still the same. You have to try vagal maneuvers and then adenosine and vagal maneuvers fail. And again, this is orthodromic because we have narrow QRS complexes. Unlike this ECG, which is exactly the same like the previous one, but we have wide QRS complexes and therefore we call this as antidromic AVRT. And this one could be mistaken for ventricular tachycardia, which we'll be seeing next, but based on the patient's presentation, the age of the patient, and some certain ECG findings, you could actually tell them apart. And in this case, you have to tell them apart because the management is different between AVRT and ventricular tachycardia. And now coming to our last regular tachycardia, the ventricular tachycardia. And ventricular tachycardia is characterized by the following. We have no P waves and we have wide QRS complexes. And there are many types of ventricular tachycardia, but we will be discussing the common ones in this video. Here we have the monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, and which means that the QRS complexes all have a similar morphology. So first we have a regular, ra uh, regular rhythm, a rapid ventricular rate with wide QRS complexes, absent P waves all over the ECG, and the similar QRS morphologies. Now the question is, how can we tell this ECG apart from SVT with aberration? 
Most of the previous types that we've discussed in SVT, if they present with aberration, as in bundle branch block, they will have a white QRS as well. So how can we tell that one from this one? Because the management is is quite different. So we need to have some criteria to tell them to tell them apart. And for our next video, we will be discussing this important point. This ECG shows us a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Again, we have a regular rhythm, rapid rate, white QRS complexes, no P waves, but we have different morphologies of the QRS complexes and therefore called as polymorphic. And our last slide here, we have Tursa D point, which is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia plus QT prolongation. And on this ECG, you can see that right before the polymorphic tachycardia happened, we had a QT prolongation plus two T wave inversion and a U wave, all of which happened due to hypokalemia in this patient. And you can see the QT prolongation, it is longer than the half of the RR interval. And you can see that uh, apart from the QT prolongation, you could tell that this is torsat from the twisting of the QRS around the isoelectric baseline. So you can see here the QRS complexes are twisting around the baseline. This is all for regular tachycardias. Thank you for watching this long and hopefully I'll see you in the next video with the following title, How to Tell ventricular tachycardia from SVT with aberrancy. Thank you very much. Have a good day.